This is an amazing turnout. Thank you, oh blessed Tito, uh, for launching us. Thanks to uh, Dean Stover and Dan Brazil. And Dan, Dan will be playing again uh, at the end after the readings. I'm Cynthia Hogue, the current director of Creative Writing. And wow, wow, thank you so much for coming out and for figuring out what um, semi-formal means to you. <laughs> um, I'm just going to do little introductions of the out-of-town guests. Um, and every now and then, I'm going to tell you something that you wouldn't read in a bio. Um, we're lucky to have all of our wonderful readers. Um, and Jenny Irish, thank you again. Yeah. Wherever you are. She's probably hiding behind that pillar. <laughs> so what a pleasure to welcome 2012 MFA alumna Adrian Selt back to ASU on the occasion of the program's 30th anniversary celebrations which just happens to coincide with Adrienne's publishing her magical debut novel, The Daughters, called by Editor's Choice one of 2015's best books. As Tara Eisen writes, the roles we play, the tales we tell each other and ourselves, how else to rec reconcile our longing for fanciful escape with our desperate need for authentic love? What's so admirable about Adrienne's insightful depiction of this paradox is her intimate knowledge of the human heart, and I'd add her largesse of spirit. Adrienne Selt. Thank you very much, Cynthia, and thank you, Tito, and thank you, everyone, for coming. This It, it is a huge honor to be back here, um, as it was an honor to talk to some a bunch of current MFA and undergraduate students today about life as a writer after the MFA program. And um, I may have painted a daunting picture, but it can't be too bad if you get to end up here um, at events like this with audiences as warm as these. So. Um, so I'm going to read from my book, The Daughters, and I am not going to read from the beginning in a slight break of tradition because I'm trying to be a little bit humane to you guys about how much I read, given how many readers there are. Um, but also this is a section I've been wanting to read that was not quite long enough for an evening when I was reading alone. Um, so what you need to know about the book in general is that it is it, it follows um, four generations of women from post-World War II um, Poland, well, pre-World War II, War II Poland to post-World War II Chicago, present-day Chicago. Um, and the protagonist, Lulu, is an opera singer who was raised by her grandmother to believe that their family, um, their family made a deal with the devil so that all of the women in their family line would be progressively more beautiful and musically talented at a cost. And for Lulu, one of those, the costs of that was uh, the loss of a relationship with her mother, Sarah. And this section um, sort, of, sort of plays on the relationship between all three of those women, Lulu, Ada, and Sarah, and their relationships to one another and to Poland and, and to the, the stories that bind them together. History is like any other story. It depends on us. It feeds on us, on our desire to get it right. But what if there is no way to know exactly how something was, what it meant? What if an event is too complicated to make sense of, to ever put your finger on? Most people vaguely remember Frédéric Chopin to be French. His father hailed from Lorraine, and his compositions were romantic, so it seemed aesthetically appropriate to tie him to the city of love and light. Indeed, he died in Paris. His body was interred there in Père Lachaise Cemetery after he drowned in the fluid of his own lungs. So he is called Frédéric François Chopin, and listeners feel haute and beau monde when they put their children to sleep with his nocturnes. But 
In fact, he was born in a small country estate in Jalava Vavola. He was christened in the same church in central Poland where his parents had been married, and he grew up under the watchful red turrets of the Warsaw Barbican. His family lived on the grounds of the Saski Palace, and as a boy, Chopin played a small piano with heart-shaped legs under a window that looked down on trimmed trees and lawns as slick as seal's fur. Is it just the glamour of Paris that makes audiences wish it was the musician's home? Well, what about the romance of something star-crossed? Chopin left for France just before Poland rose up and was crushed down by the hand of the Russian Empire, making it unsafe for him to return. In all his time in Paris, Chopin never sought fluency in French and always kept a silver chalice filled with soil from his homeland. Still, when he died, the Parisians didn't want to give him up. They collected their most buxom women and had them throw armfuls of roses over his grave to bury him deep below the French streets. Their nattiest gentlemen poured out decanters of wine to confuse Chopin's spirit and keep it happy in the company of Theodore Jericho, Dominique Vivant, and Vincenzo Bellini. They kept his bones, the distals at the tip of his fingers that stroked the keys of his instrument, the elegant tibia, even the skull. An artisan made a death mask of his face and reproductions of it hung in the best houses of Paris. But Poland, with the power of the Rusalka riding in her wet rolling hills, residing in her wet rolling hills and icy streams, called his soul back. By decree of his sister, Chopin's chest was cracked open and his heart removed to a marble pillar in the Holy Cross Church in Warsaw. Side note, that's true. <laughs> I used to imagine this with hysterical visit vividness. The organ resting on a velvet pillow stuffed with down, surrounded by slick satin lining. All the fabric was red and glistened like exposed muscle tissue, a new warm chest for the heart to inhabit with wooden ribs and an ivory clasp. And because a child's imagination knows no boundaries of taste and is never stilled by fear of excess, the heart reposed with piles of rubies. There were holly berries and pomegranate seeds and the flesh of ripe figs burst open by their own internal weight. The heart was beating. No, my mother said when I told her this fantasy. Actually, it's preserved in cognac, probably inside a glass bottle. I wonder. She paused and wet her lips with whatever was in her cup. How that affects the flavor of the cognac. <laughs> the sparkle in her eyes was truly indecent. Sarah sighed and leaned back in her chair. She closed her eyes and I shrank away from her, my nightgown brushing against my ankles. It must be exquisite, she laughed, or disgusting, repugnant, repellent, but still a completely unique experience. Was Chopin Polish or was he French? You could say both and be satisfied. But people always want to tell a story that has loyalties. They want you to form a hierarchy of love. As a child, I listened at night for dark clickings, the sound of heels with the tips danced off, a whiff of cigarette smoke curling under the door. I wasn't allowed to stay up waiting for my mother, but sometimes I would snap awake in the middle of the night and know she was there, her key easing into the lock, a breathy curse echoing when she turned to heel. I could picture her routine perfectly, making her way to the hallway table and balancing on one foot, her weight bearing down with one palm on the table. One shoe slid off, then the other, tucking her hair behind her ears in the dark mirror. I was not a part of this routine. A kiss goodnight was not usual. Most often, I would drift back to sleep while she was running the bathroom tap. She liked to fall asleep with legs freshly shaved, which is a habit I have stolen from her. Sarah's nocturnal behavior was animalistically private. You might make educated guesses about what she would do, predictions based on observation, but her motivation was always, motivations were always her own. She ignored me often enough to lead me to expect it and she loved me just enough to pit my stomach with yearning. Most nights, she would leave the bathroom and go straight to her bed, bare feet making sticky, quiet sounds back down the hallway, but sometimes this. My door opening a crack, letting in a slim line of moonlight that leaked from the windows into the hall. 
and my mother's figure looking down on me. Often, I would pretend to be sleeping, and she would tiptoe to my bedside, lay the back of her hand across my hot cheek. If she happened to come in following a nightmare, she would crawl into my bed and hold me, sing a lullaby against the rhythmic gulping of my sobs. Swing low, sweet chariot, all the pretty little horses. Her songs were gravel, loneliness, a puff of smoke, the most beautiful songs I'd ever heard. Lalka, she would whisper, come on, you know the words. The dark wrapped around us as Sarah shifted and settled, and we kept our voices quiet so that Otto wouldn't hear us and wake up. It was more pol than politeness that kept us hushed. We were swaddled by the delis delicious notion of being alone in the whole black world. Two sailors singing a private language on the night's inky sea. I felt her breath warming the back of my head and fell asleep, her child, her star. At some point, she would slip out the door and back to her bedroom and be swallowed up until 10 or 11 or noon the next day. She would emerge with a flowered silk dressing gown pulled around her, toenails visibly crimson when she sat down and propped her foot up on a chair in the kitchen. She would already be smoking as she walked from her room, and when she looked at me, I felt like a stranger, a blank. Your girl's got that face again, she'd say to Ada. Why don't you take her for a little while? Poland is sometimes called the Christ of Nations because of the number of times her borders have been invaded, her land divided by conquering hands. Germany, Russia, the Bohemians, the Mongols. No muster of troops ever abandoned its chance to slice up the country and take a bite. At times, Poland has existed nowhere but in the hearts of her remaining people, and so she shone brighter than she would have in the hands of real imperfect kings and ministers. And the damage that was done to the nation became, in its own way, a holy thing, a sacred basis for offense. It makes a person dangerous to love their own trouble. My mother is the best example of this that I know. Like Poland, her homeland of conception, if not of birth, she blazed with glory through her young life. She strutted into the Green Mill Jazz Bar at age 16 in full light of day and told them she was there to audition for a job. There were no open positions, but they let her sing on a lark, and she walked out with the promise of an opening act on Tuesdays. She painted dark lines around her eyes like Cleopatra, and dark red onto her lips like blood. She vamped. She dressed to precision. If she wanted a man, she blew in his ear, and he would follow her anywhere, and then she'd abandon him there. I never knew my father because she wanted it that way. Whoever he was, she just didn't care. Otta stood behind Sarah with pins in her mouth and refitted her clothes to give her the dimensions of architecture. When Sarah tilted her head to the side in a gown her mother had sewn for her, a person saw the leaning tower of Pisa. Otta curled Sarah's hair. She laughed with her about the women whose jobs Sarah usurped with a wink. And she told her how she was a credit to Greta, a person worth making a sacrifice for to the devil. When I was born, Otta took all these gifts back, and one by one, she gave them to me. It happened almost immediately, the transfer of love, the replacement of the legacy on my still soft head. How can I know this? I was only a baby. I should think that pampering and love is simply my due. But I know my mother. She's the one who taught me the phrase, Christ of nations. She's the one who taught me about war and invasion. Every story I ever heard from my Baba Ada about our great-grandmother great Greta, I heard again from my mother Sarah another way. For one thing, what Ada called our family's gift, Sarah assured me was a curse. My childhood was very different in her eyes and in her mouth. Thank you.